today we are here to attend the talk by Alfonso. So Alfonso was born in San Jose, uh, Costa Rica in 67. Uh, Alfonso holds a baccalaureate degree in electronics engineering from the Instituto Tecnológico de Costa Rica and a doctorate in engineering from the Universidad Nacional de Mar del Plata in Argentina in 2009. He also holds a Magister Literarum in English literature from the University of Costa Rica. He has published several papers on digital acoustic signal processing and has served as a reviewer for several IEEE conferences and journals, such as IEEE sensor journals, IEEE transaction circuits in system two, uh, and the spring analog integrated uh, circuits and signal processing. He shared the 2011 National Literature Award in his country for his novel, El Luto de la Libérola. His interests range from low power analog and digital VLSI, low power signal processing and digital system architecture to philosophy and uh, literature. He's co-founder and VP of business development of RightDev since 2021. So thank you very much, Alfonso, to accept uh, uh, our invitation today here to talk about RightDev. Maybe we should uh, schedule another talk uh, to talk about your book. But okay. today uh, you are going to talk about uh, the ASIC design house. So thank you very much. And the floor is with you. Well, thank you, Ricardo, for having me and inviting me. And thank you to CAS for everything that's made possible for us over the past uh, years. And as you know, you know our history. And many of the guys probably here know our history. And right, it would have existed if, if it weren't for CAS and all the opportunities that we have had in the past uh, of um, sharing everything that we do at academic level and trying to bring up all those things we do in academy to the industry, to what it really matters to the people. And so let me introduce myself. I'll say I'm Alfonso. I'm, I'm actually a professor at the University or Instituto Tecnológico de Costa Rica. And in 2021, we started this project with a colleague of mine, Dr. Ronnie Garcia, and a colleague from Argentina, uh, Guillermo Wischel. Uh, and we started this uh, dream of having a Latin American-based uh, design house, uh, able to provide services to uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, my, 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 my lecture is not going to be that technical. The idea is just to give you a, a short glimpse of what we do in, in RIDEF in alliance with uh, the company of one of our partners, Guillermo Wischel. But the idea is uh, also to try to motivate other, other people, other companies to explore some of the things we're doing and trying to find a, a bigger market uh, for uh, microelectronics in the region. How, how do we manage to start uh, claiming ground in the world market, in the microelectronics world market? How do we do that? I mean, uh, Ricardo Reyes has been a pioneer and Cass has been a pioneer. In the, past decades trying to uh, move forward uh, the idea of having uh, microelectronic powerhouses in the region. We have some, all of them are foreigner, most, most of them are foreign and not Latin American. Well, the next step is how do we create our own powerhouses? I mean, uh, Latin American powerhouses. And, and the idea is to give you an, uh, some examples of how had we, a Costa Rican slash Argentinian company, had managed to uh, grab a hole, a small bit of the market, and how do we see an opportunity of uh, growing into that sector and gaining attention so we can also leverage other areas of the micro, uh, microelectronics uh, environment and, and, as I said, claiming more space in the worldwide microelectronics market. So that's the agenda. That's basically what I, what I want to share with you. And what do we do? We're uh, design house that offers um, all the services that any design house typically a modern uh, offers to, to the world. Um, we're basically um, located in the front end 
side of the business. That means we do mostly RTL and verification design, both for ASIC and FPGA. We also have a share of our team uh, involved in the development of software, particularly firmware, whenever it's related to uh, a particular application, either a firmware re required for an ASIC or an FPGA or for an embedded system. And we also uh, provide support in, in the development of specific pieces of hardware related to any of these applications. Uh, the idea is that we try to apply the knowledge we've acquired in the past uh, years and, and decades in this area and try to provide with uh, quality services around the world. So we're a small company, no more than 50 people, uh, adding up all the people in Costa Rica and the people in Argentina. Um, but if we consider uh, the achievement of, of our um, our people, we can uh, say, say, uh, we say that we well, we're pretty comfortable because we can sell this uh, ability of, of of these capacities to to people that the first thing is going to ask is okay, how many chips do you have under your belt? And that's one of the big questions whenever whenever you're trying to, to, to achieve a, a, a new customer in an area in which they're not used to seeing Latin American faces or, or people or names <laughs> in these areas. And well, we can confidently say that in our case, uh, among ourselves, we, we have more than 50 tape out solutions in nodes all the way down to three nanometers using TSMC, Intel uh, processes. And we have more than uh, uh, 150 plus FPGA solutions in the top notch uh, FPGAs you can imagine. And we've achieved that in the, during the past few years. Of course, not in Rider. Rider is a very, very new company, but we've managed to assemble this team of people that come from the industry, for Intel, Hill Packard, and many other places. And integrated with our management, we're now capable of, of offering our capacities to the rest of the world. So, but I don't want to talk too much about uh, um, Rydiv as a company, but as an example of what we can do in the region. Um, we offer, uh, because we know we have the knowledge to offer uh, production or, or the design of chips from architectural specification all the way down to the PCB and the platform bring up, and even providing support to post silicon testing. And all those things I think are available throughout the region. I mean, this is not something that is located in a, in a, in a small uh, city, in a, in, a, in a university. For my experience in past LASCAS and many other conferences I've attended in, in Latin America in the past decades, I mean, we know we've had that, that cap capacities here in Latin America for a long time. And I think it's right now we're in the, in, in the middle of a situation we can take advantage of what's going on around the world with all the crisis around the supply and logistics and everything in the semiconductor in the semiconductor industry, and take advantage of that and 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 use that as a maybe as a point of entry for the talent that we have in the region and increase uh, our presence in the world. So uh, basically, this is this is again a, a small um, brief account of what we do. So I don't, I'm not going to stop too much on that. The, you're going to have the presentation in case you're interested in what we do, but it's typically what you get from an SPGA and ASIC design uh, house, either di digital or mixed in, and we also do some analog, not that much, but we have also uh, covered some, some analog designs from some customers. We have a major knowledge of all the, all the commercial flows and languages and methodologies. And as I said, we've worked from 180 nanometers all the way down to three nanometers. So we have the expertise for that. Our engineers have the expertise for that. And we also have uh, capacities for embedded systems designs. So what's, what's the focus? What I really want to bring uh, to your attention here is, is not what do we do at Rydiv, but why do we think right now we're in the middle of a situation that is that we have to take advantage of right now? And as you know, there's been a lot of uh, commotion around the world, particularly after the pandemics. I mean, because of the chip uh, shortage situation, all the logistics that that uh, uh, were affected and, and disrupted because of the uh, pandemics and the geopolitical situation that is, is taking hold in the world. And that has uh, implicated, in, um, that has resulted in a major shift in the commercial balance 
of, of how are goods traded, particularly the, the, the goods related to the semiconductor industry, how are they traded around the world? And right now, a big window of opportunity is being opened in the Americas because of the decision of the U.S. of declaring, of uh, trying to uh, move forward their own industry and opening what they what they see a as a as a chance for American companies, U.S. companies to improve uh, everything that's related to the semiconductor um, production chain, okay? And that's why they have this U.S. Chips and Science Act that maybe you've heard of that was signed as a, a U.S. law last year that's going to provide a lot of money to American companies who want to expand uh, R&D operations, production, and everything. But... Um, the U.S., I mean, they know they, they cannot do that alone. I mean, because they've used to, uh, they've used to depend now on, um, on, on China, on, on Asia, many other regions, because they don't have enough capacity by themselves, okay, to handle the needs for the, for the coming generations, particularly with the explosion of intelli artificial intelligence and all, all these new fields that are going to really impact the need in semiconductors in, in, the, coming, in the coming decades. So right now, they, though this um, particular um, law is mainly aimed at American companies, many of these companies have realized that they're not going to be able to do that by themselves. So they need to find new allies. And they, they want their allies to be located in the Americas. And that's one of the things that uh, in, in resulted in the inclusion within that same law of a small fraction of money, not that much. Uh, I think it was like $300 million, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not really sure about that. But it's not that much. But as, at least now they, they have an opening and that's, that's going to be handled in the way of how to uh, improve the relationships, the commercial relationships in the semiconductor chain with all the countries in the Americas in order to, uh, of course, support their own chip production. And as an initial phase, the U.S. has announced that at least uh, it's incorporating three Latin American partners, six in the world, three in Latin America, as an initial step uh, to work and explore uh, where can uh, they find um, the technological support for what they're aiming at right now? So, as you see right now, the, the, the focus is very, very small. They basically devoted most of this $300 million to support training and, and the improvement of capabilities in the area of test and assembly. Okay. Uh, mainly, this mainly driven by the presence of Intel in Costa Rica. We have to be honest about that, because that's the the, the major test plan there reopened this year. In, 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 they reopened last year in, in, in Costa Rica, but this is just the first step. Actually, next week there's going to be a, a, the first of a city of a conference that, for what I've heard, has, are going to take place all around Latin America. And the idea is that the Department of State in the United States is going to hold these um, seminars in order to see or to scout the possibility of improving the capabilities of in, in the area of uh, technical capacity for semiconductors in the whole region. So the first symposium is going to take place next week in Costa Rica. But if you read the document, and I'm leaving you the links there, the idea is these symposiums are going to take place all around Latin America or certain key players in Latin America. And the idea is that they need to extend uh, uh, these possibilities because they want to stop depending on uh, uh, the Asian uh, providers they usually have. And as I, I had a meeting uh, about a month ago, no, a couple of months ago, where, where there was uh, some people from the Semiconductor Association in, in the US and, and, and some people from uh, Intel, that those are the ones who de decide where a new uh, uh, plant is going to be. And one of the major, uh, actually, players in that, I mean, is, is the guy who basically decides where is Intel going to place a new, a new site. He said that even though Intel has no plans to establish new sites in Latin America in the near future, that doesn't mean that they don't want to buy part of the supplies or part of the equipment or part of the services they have in the rest of the Americas, because they want to cut their dependency from Asia 
and other and even uh, even uh, India. And well, that's good news for us because that means they're looking for someone here nearby who can support them. But that means that we also have to, in a way, step up our game and see if we're able to uh, take advantage of this uh, proposition. So what I want to just discuss uh, during the rest of the presentation is give you an idea of how and in, in writing, in a way, very uh, maybe it was an accident, I don't know, but we've been able to take advantage of some of that stuff because I don't know if you notice. I mean, if you any of you guys have uh, works in the industry, that many U.S. companies are trying now to find more services in areas that are closer to the time zone, and, and because of of this shift, uh, geo geopolitical shift, they're also looking for uh, strategic partners that are vetoed by the U.S. I mean, that, that that they really can work with the U.S. And so we find that that opportunity. We we. Uh, decided with our partner in Argentina that it was a good idea to set up a new um, uh, uh, enterprise. And we established this joint venture bet be between Emtec that as a company has been existed for almost 15 years in Argentina. And some new guys in Costa Rica, that's me and my, and my, and my partner Ronnie and, and, and some other guys that came from, from industry, Intel and Hewlett Packard. And we set up shop. Uh, we started selling these services. Uh, we added the new services to what uh, Emtech already had. That was FPGA design, FPGA verification, hardware design, all the things they already had. And we added the, the, the AC component. And with all the major things that you require for an AC design company. And we were able to find customers. That's a good thing. <laughs> we were able to find some customers. And actually, uh, during the past two years, we've been work working in, in two very interesting projects, big projects for uh, uh, American startups. I cannot tell you the names, but uh, the two big startups uh, with big funding. Uh, one of them, one of one of them, hired our services to provide support in the design of two ASICs, 100 plus million gates using a seven nanometer TSMC process. And we were, um, though we did some design, actually, uh, maybe a third of the of, of the two chips are designed by our, by our engineers. We found a niche, a very interesting niche in verification, in functional verification, because that's where the big need was. I mean, that, that's where they really depended on us. And we actually were able to step up and provide a lot of solutions to them. And that's what clinched the business for us because we were able not only to provide uh, design services, but also verification services. And the other project we had for another uh, big uh, uh, startup is, is devoted to satellite communication. This was not still not done at the ASIC level, it's done at FPGA level, but actually it was a very funny thing. It was, uh, they contacted our partners because they needed to port a, an old design that was a thought to, uh, was originally designed for an ASIC and they wanted to port that, uh, to, to refactor that into an FPGA, go back. <laughs> And so that's what we did. Our, our company stepped in. We helped them with all the, the, uh, the refactoring of the new design into the modern FPGAs. And we actually added a lot of new stuff to this company that basically is doing is selling services of satellite to smartphone connections. And we did a lot of stuff here in the order, uh, not only of design, but also verification that became very important. And right now, actually, we're not negotiating, but um, and the first steps of trying to figure out maybe this company is interested into doing now an ASIC. So we're uh, uh, having now conversations in that regard, of course, very, very premature. But anyway, those two big projects in the past two years has, uh, had uh, a show to us that, yes, we were able to do what we thought we could. And uh, we're also partnered with other companies. As uh, I mentioned, Argentina, because well, Mtech, that's one of our partners or the co-founders of Ride It, comes from from Argentina. But we also partner with other companies, and I think that's uh, from other regions of Latin America. And that's one of the things I want to mention also here. That's very important. Uh, we don't have to have everything. If we manage to set up the, the the collaboration modes with other companies, I mean, we know we can handle everything. That really helps us a lot. And in this case, for instance, there is a, a company in Uruguay uh, belongs to my good friend Alfredo Arno, uh, ABM Solutions. Uh, we were faced with this problem. A, a, a guy from a Belgian startup came up and asked us if we would 
helping with some mixed signal design. Well, we were able to, to do the digital part, but we didn't have the expertise to do the analog part. So we contacted Alfredo and his team, Matias, and we worked with them and set up a nice project. And we worked for a year and a half on, uh, together, There's the three companies, well, Pride Advantage and ABM Solutions in Uruguay. And we delivered this project and actually the company we delivered this project to was in the process of testing the chips when they were bought by another startup. So the guys were really happy, an American startup bought them. I cannot tell the names, but anyway, it's, 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 it's very much related to the automotive parts uh, sector in the industry. And that showed that there is a way of, of having synergy between con uh, different companies in different countries, as far apart as Costa Rica, Argentina, and Uruguay, and getting together and uh, bringing uh, forward a very complex uh, project like this one, for instance, uh, were two chips, two chips actually, that's those were the ones we, we designed for, for this company. Okay, so I think that the, the, the main issue here and what we've noticed, not only by speaking with our customers, but also you know the several meetings we've had in the past uh, few weeks regarding the Chips Act initiative and then all this movement around of how do we do we get a the semiconductor chain, I mean, logistics and everything uh, integrated into the Americas. We now we notice that there is a big, big growing need of verification engineers and verification IPs all around the world. I mean, this is one of the main hot uh, bottom issues uh, that, that needs to be addressed. And we know that the idea, okay, so the good thing would be to have I mean, the whole, the whole setup of, of, of possibilities of our industry here, but it's very difficult. But if you find a niche and you take advantage of that, that's going to bring the attention to you. And we've noticed several things that are very interesting, particularly that uh, many ASIC design companies are tied to the old way of doing things. And they don't really want to use the new models and their senior engineers are tied to the old ways and they don't really want to use all the all the capabilities that you get for things like UVM and stuff like that. And we found something very interesting that, that in the end also was sort of difficult for us because they all wanted senior engineers. They all wanted guys with 10, 15 years of experience in, in verification for the projects we were handed to. The problem is that if you get a guy with 15 years of experience in verification, most of the time, this guy uh, doesn't really know what's new and he's not uh, very much into the new languages, the new standards, the new methodologies. And actually they were having that, those problems in their own companies when they approached us. And we showed them that if we provide only a couple of senior engineers with a good set of uh, um, junior engineers that we could support and, and give them training, we were able to solve the problems they had. And actually, they were very, very much surprised by the results we provided with guys that only had one, two years of having left uh, uh, university, and they were able to to fix the problems that they hadn't fixed for for months. And now I'm going to tell you why. But anyway, co going back to the need, if, if this this these numbers are taken from from uh, an study was. Uh, uh, requested by Siemens, who you, who you know is one of the major providers, EDA providers in, in IC verification and design. And they found this trend. I mean, they now validated this trend that, I mean, for each engineer in design, you need three engineers in doing verification because of the complexity of the new designs that are coming our way. And we've seen this growth of on the need of more verification engineers, more verification engineers, in uh, ASIC and FPGA design, both both uh, areas, and actually, well, you can you can access this study, and you will have the the, the slides, so you can have a look at them. Um, and that means that also because of that uh, concentration of, of of resources in in, in verification, that the standardization is being taken place uh, with all the efforts by Accelera and IEEE to standardize the verification. Uh, flows. Now we see now there's a big, big concentration in what we call UVM, that the, the standard that's being provided by, by Accelera, the universal verification methodology, not only in the ASIC design, but also more and more in FPGA design, which wasn't in the past, but now uh, this has been taking, um, it's, been, it's been gaining momentum. And that means that uh, if you get people training UVM, if you get people training system value, you get 
someone is going to get high real fast, okay? And of course, there are many issues regarding UVM, okay? We have the pros, for instance, we know that the, the good thing about UVM is that it's reusable, standard, you can scale it, no problem. It's, 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 it's meant to for, for debugging, okay, and it can be automated. But we know, okay, that you have to learn the language, the system very long, then you have to learn the, the libraries, and it's sort of complicated. I mean, we know the system very long is not as, as compact as, as Python. <laughs> I mean, not, not even as, uh, as, as C++. I mean, it's, it's more difficult than, than those languages. And of course, that, of course, entails that the flexibility is limited. And there's a lot of dependencies, but particularly on the issue that very few companies offer uh, right now, the complete tool flows, uh, in order to, to take advantage of, of, of all the, all the um, possibilities that uh, UVM gives. Okay, you're mentioning Siemens, Cadence, Syn uh, Synopsis, uh, maybe Aldec, a couple of comp silence probably, I don't know. So it's difficult to find that. But anyway, even considering those things, and, and, and that the growth of, 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 of UVM has been uh, sort of a, a massive in, in the, during the past years. The, 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 the good thing is that that still is an object-oriented program. And if you know how to do OOP, if you know how to do that, then you're halfway through. And that's one of the things we found out in our company with us. This, is, this slide shows a, a compares some of some of the problems you have with system very low. Okay, if we compare with other with other uh, languages, for instance, 221 keywords <laughs> compared to only 83 by C plus plus and 23 by Python and things like that. Okay, and the problem that that most of the similarities are proprietary. But anyway, um, the the problem then that we face from whenever we get into a new client is well, we want to use UVM, but the truth is some of our seniors in the engineers don't really know UVM or they say they use UVM, but in the end they don't use the, the methodology. How do we automate this? How do we manage to, to, to integrate UVM and accelerate our verification process? And well, the, the, the first issue we found is that there is no single way of doing things because you know verification can take you for, through different alleys, okay? You can go either uh, um, for formal verification, functional verification, you can either go directed or random verification, but in the end, this, this has only uh, words because in the end, you know that under those words, there are many other things that open up. For instance, if you go to functional verification and you go dynamic world, is it going to be random? Is it going to be cycle or event driven? Are you going to do assertions or are you going to do a static assertion based at checks? I mean, um, all those things are, uh, under the hood, I mean, come up and hit you in the face. So that's where you need a, a, flexible, a flexible methodology in order to accommodate the needs of the client, but trying to standardize uh, what you're doing and, and make the necessary trade-offs. Okay, so I'm pointing out here to a very good article. Um, by the way, I'm going to tell you I'm not an expert in verification. So if you're going to come up with any questions regarding verification, I have my colleague, Dr. Ronnie Garcia here in the line. So he will answer those questions. He does very specific to, to verification. But anyway, um, if you need more information or, or an idea of, of how is this uh, handled in the industry? I, I'm pointing you to this article. Uh, actually, this article was pointed to me by my colleague, Ronnie Garcia, uh, that gives you an idea of the complexities behind how to choose a verification methodology. But uh, what I, what I want to bring to the point of here is, okay, that not only have this problem that this is a very um, complicated, full of detours, road towards achieving your needs in verification, but also that most of the time companies don't have the people who are willing to do that. And I'm talking big names here. I'm, I'm going to say it. No, I don't mind. I'm talking ARM. I'm talking Intel. I'm talking even Hewlett Packard. I mean, I'm talking big companies don't have enough people who are willing to go the way of relearning. I mean, their senior engineers are used to the ways of the past. And most of the, I've probably noticed, most of us, and I'm going to count myself in, uh, electron, electronics or electrical engineers don't like to do the way, don't, don't, don't like to do stuff the way uh, software engineers do. And though we're proud about that, we know that in the end that's problems when it comes to AC design because in the end you need to automate things, you need to program a lot, uh, programming is key. And we've run into teams where 
we found guys who are just not willing to learn scripting. I mean, they don't want to do it. I mean, they've learned the way of you, uh, writing a script in Tickle and uh, maybe some Bash, uh, maybe some Perl, and that's it. I don't want to do anything else. I mean, I'm not a programmer. I'm a hardware designer. Well, the issue is that now, I mean, hardware design is very, very much related with programming design and particularly verification. Okay, so if you're doing verification and that's the good news, then most of the time you don't really need to be such a good hardware engineer. Okay, so I know that's going to sound awful when you do because you're an electrical engineer like I am, but in the end, that's what we found that we don't need a guy with 15 years experience to become competent in a year or less than a year in a flow. You can do it if you have junior DVs, enough junior DVs guided by good senior engineers, not that much, maybe one, maybe two, that can show them the way around the tools. And if these junior DVs engineers, they have good programming skills, they have the notions, the basic notions of uh, digital design, digital architecture, but not that profound. And the very basics, I mean, not even that much of VLSI design, you can handle these problems and provide a solution these guys are looking at. Um, the second thing you have to do is once you have these guys that are willing to program, I mean, and they're willing to, to I mean, take the burden on, on, the, on their shoulders and start programming is automating things. And that's where I think that having junior guys also help, help a lot. And if you are able to automate your systems from the very beginning using uh, the input from, from these teams, and you can, you can create very complex uh, reusable systems, uh, taking advantage of everything that UVM and the tools are offering you, uh, is not that it's very easy. I mean, it's not that it's uh, like a snap, but you have enough muscle now in order to, to reach what the, the client wants. And it's, I mean, getting to the cover as required and sending your chip to to the foundry without uh, losing the, the blink of an eye. I mean, like you're going to sleep like a baby because you know there's no there's not going to be a respin. Okay, that's that's the that's the dream. Right? You don't want any respins. You want everything first silicon success. Okay, and that means taking this part of the of the design cycle very seriously. And of course, if you have then junior guys junior electrical, electronics, and software engineers that have a strong programming cap capabilities, even if they're not that well trained in the other side, you can build this stuff because we've done it. And we've actually done it three times. And if you add up agile methodologies or any other agile or, or Scrum or, or any other methodology that you use for program management, that's going to help, of course, a lot. And then you set up and a, a continuous integration, continuous delivery approach, and then you're, you're set. Of course, it's not as easy as it sounds, but the, the, the good news is what I think we can, we can uh, get over. Um, you can include, for instance, the use of linters, and we've, we found that it's very useful, I mean, to avoid uh, consuming too much time of, of simulation and stuff. Uh, rely heavily on linters so you know that your code is clean before you go into the simulators and using all, any, any all sorts of uh, batchers, slurm, or whatever you have in order to provide you with, with the throughput you need and uh, automation, for instance, uh, that, that's very key uh, here when, when you have the RALs or the, the registered abstraction layers and you have to automate the creation of those RALs, okay? You, you need tools also to help you with that. And the good thing is that if you have young engineers, they're willing to explore these new things, while senior engineers, they would like it to do it the old way. So. That's why I think that, in short, uh, we found an interesting niche. We, th we think there is a possibility for many companies in the region to start exploiting this need of functional verification services without needing right now, without requiring the number of senior engineers that one might uh, think you would need. Okay, No need for engineers specialized in VLSI to do this. I mean, you need some seniors, but not the whole bunch. And, and, and I think that for us, that's what really was key. I mean, our growth was mainly predicated on what we did in verification. And most of the guys we had in verification were juniors and they did the job and our customers are happy. And of course, that doesn't mean that we have, that we have to stop VLSI training because the idea is this is only a small niche and we don't know when artificial intelligence is going to take away that niche from us. But I think that is, that is an opening for us to, to 
make ourselves known. Okay, okay, these guys really know what they're doing. They're doing verification. Okay, they're doing really good. Maybe, maybe they can come a few years later and say, well, you do physical design, you do uh, post-silicon testing, you do analog design, okay, because you know you did that very good. So we're wondering if you're doing the other stuff. And that's, of course, uh, what we're aiming at right now is to have the whole industry uh, build build a whole uh, uh, environment of microelectronics in the region. So, of course, take my word for that. I mean, I, I, I'm not praying for the end of VLSI instruction. On, on the contrary, I, I, I agree with Ricardo and many guys. I mean, we need more and more people doing microelectronics, but I think there is an interesting window right now we can take an advantage of. So that's my talk. I'm sorry for talking too much and open up for questions if you have any uh, requests or comments, please. So thank you very much, Alfonso. So uh, the floor is open for questions. So. Um, Please do your questions using the chat channel in YouTube as soon as possible. And uh, well, as you you talked a little bit, uh, I think the big challenge we have in Latin America is to use the opportunity that there is a lack of uh, people with skills to do IC design in, uh, in the world as well as EDA yeah so uh, uh, this is a great opportunity because uh, we have clever people and uh, the point is that uh, most more people in all Latin America needs to to learn how to to do design to do verification and so on so uh, do you agree with that no of course of course uh, we, we need more people in in the field and and if if if, if we don't get that people then the opportunity is going to i mean we're going to let it pass because i mean it's right now we need them right now and in the coming few few coming years i mean like two three years four years after that we don't know i mean if the window is going to be closed so we need to take advantage of that fast and 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 bring more people into the the equation i agree completely with you yeah because there is one trend that uh, more and more all computing system, electronic system should end by a chip, you not know, to be more reliable, yeah. to expand, uh, to use less power and so on. So how you can comment? Can you comment on this? Yeah, no, I think that, that that's good news. We know that, for instance, uh, everything related to uh, artificial intelligence on the edge, I mean, uh, it's, it's going to take advantage of what we call the uh, Internet of Things in the past, I mean, like we need chips doing the uh, easy processing, I mean, uh, in order to get a, 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 get information off the cloud, I mean, leave the cloud for the complex things and, and do the basic things and, and the collection of information of the initial processing on chip. And that's, that's why we're seeing this explosion. I mean, like the other day I was, I don't remember the names, but the numbers but uh, for a combustion engine car i think there were like 50 chips or 75 chips uh, for an electric for an ev electric vehicle there were like 250 uh, from the basic models all the way up to several thousands for the most complex so that's a big opportunity because now you're talking that each car is going to have a thousand chips inside okay We're driving all the sensors and everything that's needed so there's the opportunity the, the problem is that there's not enough people not even India or China, China were used to provide that people have enough people to handle that. And actually, one of the big issues that is not very much mentioned uh, in the discussions is not that the foundries weren't able to produce enough chips, because that's one of the things that they were brought up during the chip shortage uh, period. But the, the truth was that there weren't enough design houses around the world to provide the design, because there weren't enough engineers to, to design those chips. So in the end, that meant that even uh, China or India were having lead times of two years. Like you were asking a design how that, hey, I want to design a chip. Well, give me two years and I'll be able to take it. I mean, like, so that's a big opportunity. And, and that means that is coming our way because, because of the geopolitical situation. Now the U.S. wants to do business with us right now. We don't know if that's going to happen. I mean, it's going to stay for that, that way for long, but it's a way to establish relationships with, with uh, American companies willing to do business here and, and, and services. That, that's something we have to explore really aggressively. 
Yeah, I think if they are clever, they can trust more in Latin American people than uh, from some other locations abroad. No? Yeah, I think they're being forced to do that. I mean, like um, because of the geopolitical situation, and and I think that uh, uh, the interest that the Department of State is showing into having all these conversations all around the region means that they're willing to open up to something that in the past was mainly, I mean, closed for us. I was a path that was not available. Okay, mm -hmm. so we have to take advantage to that. And the issue that, as you mentioned the other day to me through email, there are several American companies already operating in Latin America. That most of them are doing are doing design, but in a small level. Well, we can foster those relationships with those American companies already started in the year. In, cost, in, in Latin America, Synopsis, Cadence, uh, Intel, Hewlett Packard, uh, you mentioned a couple of more, other more in Brazil. Okay, so, okay, let's try yeah, to we show that. We should be open to, to receive uh, international companies, but uh, it's strategic to have a local, to have yeah. a local companies, yeah. like high dev, uh, like uh, we have Chipos here Chipos. in yeah. Santa Catarina and others, no? So yeah. this is the, uh, uh, we have here in, in Brazil a very nice example that is the transport. If you see an airplane that is yeah. a quite high tech, we have a Embraer that is competing worldwide, uh, selling airplanes worldwide and so on. Then uh, buses also, Marco Polo is also mm -hmm. selling buses and uh, but cars, no. No, we don't have All cars. All the companies that are established in Brazil are uh, international companies so they decide uh, to where the local uh, companies can sell their cars you no know? general motors of brazil cannot sell general motors cars to anywhere in the world just to the location that uh, the yeah. headquarters decide you no know? so why we don't have a local brand of cars in in brazil or any south american country you no know? yeah so uh, yeah, that's, that's a very interesting questions, but I think that uh, uh, regarding electronics right now, there's an opportunity. And, mm -hmm. and I think that uh, we have the, the possibility right now because of what I've seen in the environment around. We have enough people to, to give it a try, but still we need more people. That I completely agree. More, yeah. Well, but I'm seeing no questions here from the chat. If there is someone that is still wants to do a question, please do uh, as up. Uh, if no, uh, I think we should close the session. And thank you uh, again for the very nice talk. And I, I wish you a great success to Right Dev. And thank you. Uh, also, but another point that you you talk at, uh, uh, is uh, the fundamental to to people here to have skills on uh, uh, IC verification, no? Yeah. So uh, that is something we need to really take advantage of because there's a real need for that. And there's an opening right now around the world. I mean, many, many uh, IC verification engineers are needed. Um, my experience is that you don't need, I mean, the, the, the learning curve is not as steep as on other areas of ELSI. So there's a way of fast, uh, there's a way of fast growing that 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 niche and, and so make the, ourselves known. The big challenge is to introduce all these uh, topics in the undergrad courses in electrical engineering, computer yeah. engineering, and so on. So this uh, majority of uh, undergrad uh, programs in Latin America don't have these subjects. No. Yeah, no, I I agree, and and that's something we have to work on. <laughs> yeah so thank you very much again well, Alfonso I hope to see you soon in person okay yeah uh, sure. you all the best with the, the new company and a great success and uh, thank you very much you're see welcome you thank soon. you for having me bye bye, bye, -bye.